Hello and welcome to Myth Makers, the podcast for fantasy fans and creatives brought to you by the Oxford Centre for Fantasy. My name is Julia Golding. I'm the director of the centre and an author. And today I'm joined by a friend of the centre, Paula Calamaris, who, um, amongst many things, is an author and also an expert on creative writing. And today, Paula and I, we're going to talk about the recent Amazon Prime trailer, which revealed the title of the series expected in September. Uh, Only a very little bit of information was released, but we somehow will find a lot to talk about, I'm sure, because it gives some interesting clues. So first of all, Paula, do you want to tell us what the series is called? Well, they're calling it The Rings of Power. Uh, it's it's actually going to say Lord of the Rings and then the Rings of Power. I think as you know, they want to make sure that the Tolkien family is is happy with that. And um, it's as you said, it's starting on September second, and it looked really intriguing. And as soon as I saw it, I said, I have to send this to Julia. So that's <laughs> yeah. the first thing I did. Yeah, it was amazing when you actually watch the clicks because it is a very very brief. There's no shots of actors or anything. Uh, for those of you who haven't yet got to it, it's it's a like a title credit sequence, really, um, with molten gold being poured into a, uh, a thing that says "Rings of Power." Now, there's a little, a couple of things to draw out of this. The first thing is um, the, a, a funny thing that happened on social media afterwards, which was that quite a lot of people were saying it doesn't look, the special effects don't look very good. Uh, like on Reddit and places like that. Um, according to my son who follows it on Reddit, that hadn't struck me at all. And then they released a making of video, which shows it's actually not special effects at all. They actually really did pour molten gold or equivalent metal into a um a mold and then pour water on top of that to reduce the steam so what we're looking at is actually real life footage and it just goes to show that how our appetite for special effects have mean we no longer can tell (laughs) and we're accusing real things of being fake so i know i I love that i saw that video also and i thought that that's really amazing that they actually got a blacksmith to pour the gold and to create the rings yeah, because so obviously before, what the series is going to be is about the rings, yeah. all of them. There is quite a them. lot of um, beginning uh, title sequence that have this kind of artifact being made at the moment. Uh, the Crown, I think, was re- responsible for starting this off. So you've got a kind of Lord of the Rings version of the Crown here. But anyway, that's a little sidebar. But let's actually talk about the content of it. Um, the other thing that we get is a voiceover um, of somebody or a lady reciting the famous poem from the beginning of Lord of the Rings um, of, about the rings, the one ring to rule them all uh, poem. What did you think of that? What does that tell us? Um, that is, from what I've been able to understand, that's uh, Morfith, uh Clark, and she's going to be playing Galadriel. Okay, so it's the voice of the young Galadriel. The now, young Galadriel. That also started a whole nother thread, which was people saying um, she doesn't sound like Kate Blanchett, which she she doesn't. Um, she, I suppose you could say she's playing the younger uh, Galadriel, but actually because elves live so long, she's not that much younger. She's only a, no, she's, she's only a few thousand years younger. It's not, it's not, it's not much. Nothing. But... It has nothing for now. Um, <laughs> so poor the poor old uh, was it Morfith? You said her name. Yes. Yeah. So it's it's a bit of a tough act to go up against. Possibly may have been a safer play to go for a completely different voice. But anyway, we're sure that there's a reason for that within the world of the the script. But I I would have gone for Keller Brimble myself or a voice that is like a male voice, which we don't yet know. So you don't get the unfortunate comparisons. Anyway, so let's have a look at what the story of the Rings of Power actually means in terms of the Second Age. So again, let's first of all think about where we can find out information. Um, the first and sort of easiest place for most people to go is the appendices of Return of the King, where there's a timeline, which dis- and one of the timelines is of the Second Age. So what do you think are the highlights within that that the um, title is leading us towards? 
I think it's leading us primarily, obviously, towards the creation of the rings because the second age is so long. It's mm -hmm. thousands of years long and there are so many stories. I mean, you have Numenor, you have Gilgalad, you have everybody. I mean, everybody who has an impact eventually on the third age is forging rings and they're um, creating difficulties. They're trying to get to Arda. They're trying to do all of these different things. And you have Sauron in the background trying to manipulate everybody to get ultimate power, which he will eventually do after Celebrimbor makes the rings, the, the elven rings. So let's just talk about that little element. Um, most people who have sort of paid any attention to the Tolkien stories will be familiar with Galadriel and Celeborn, who we meet in um, the Fellowship of the Ring in Lothlorien. Uh, if that's both in the book and in the film, depending where you're coming at this from. Uh, also, another important person in the Second Age is Elrond, who they will yes. think, oh yes, that's the guy uh, from Rivendell, oh, yeah. who who holds that very long meeting. <laughs> that's certainly a very long meeting in the book. Um, but there's a couple of new names, or relatively new names, and probably the most important of those is Celebrimbor. Can you tell us a little bit about him and what his role is? Well, Celebrimbor is, um, I believe, the grandson of Feanor, who creates the Silmarillions in the book. And he is an artificer. He makes things. And he is seduced by Sauron. And he likes the idea of making these rings. So he works with Sauron. Uh whose name I can't remember, but he was Anis something. He's in disguise. He's, he's in, in disguise, disguise, and I can't remember his disguise name. I'm sorry. Um, he's in disguise, and he seduces him. But there's something about him that Celebrimbor doesn't quite trust. So even though the, the nine rings for the mortal men and the seven for the dwarf lords are made under Sauron's um, aegis, as it were, uh, he goes off and he makes the three uh, elven rings for the for the for their lords. Um, he makes the three of them on his own, so they're not they've never been touched by Sauron. So he has no power over them, and he doesn't. And Sauron doesn't really get any power over the rings until about 10, 20 years after Celebrimbor has finished the elven rings, and then he makes the one ring which kind of controls rules them all, as it were. Um, so that Celebrimbor and, and we'll meet a really nasty fate, but we don't have to go there because they're going to have a series about it. But uh, it's, it's a fascinating story how, how this, um, how this elf Lord can just create this stuff without, without the help of Sauron, who is actually a Meyer, who is actually one step above or one step below the Valor. And who's turned to evil, but he appears with a seductive face. He's kind of like, you know, uh, the beauty of Lucifer coming yeah, in. Yeah, I think that's, that's definitely, it's like the Garden of Eden being run in a different way. It's the temptation yeah. to, to knowledge or right. It's, it's something about that going on there. Just to um, uh, gloss a name you mentioned, you mentioned Fiano, which again, if you're not really deep in the grass of the, the ring Sorry. stuff, <laughs> Um, so this is, there are patterns of stories in Tolkien and they're often around an artifact that is created and then becomes a, a matter of dispute. So over in the West, Fianor creates the Silmarils, which are these fantastic jewels that sort of capture light. You know, they're amazing, amazing, desirable objects. And the first age is dominated by what happens when those are stolen because uh, he tries to go and there's like a... It, causes a fracture in the elven people and which is why some of the elves come over back to middle earth and um establish themselves there and it's, it's that's that's the first age really uh it's a long story read about it in the silmarillion which as you can tell is all about <laughs> the, the silmarillion you know so um a book that you may not have got to yet but that's yeah that's the silmarillion um, too many names. Yeah, too many names. <laughs> Celebrimbor is Fianor's grandson, and his father is Carufin. And so they're part of the breakaway faction who come across the ice and set up in Middle Earth. 
And many th you've got to Im imagine that many thousands of years of passing, long time is passing. He comes over to a region called Aregion, which is, if you're imagining the map of Middle Earth with the misty mountains going down the middle, it's on the western side by the gates of Moria. They come there because they've heard that the dwarves have found um, mithril, which is the special metal that is uh, you meet in the corslet that Bilbo and Frodo both wear. It's a special, powerful metal. They've come for that, and they set up a kingdom, an elven kingdom, and they're friends with the dwarves. It's one of the few times in Middle-earth history where there's a friendship between the dwarves and the elves. And so they're there with this community, which is um, working in harmony, and into that comes Sauron in disguise. And he, by his cleverness, um, his attractiveness, and his brilliance as a creator, gets seduces. It's not through a sort of passion. It's through a passion for creating things. Exactly. And that's exactly. a, a deeply in, in the Fianor family. That's clearly one of their sort of main things they're interested in. And that's what gets them. It's the desire to create. So, you know, everyone beware, all you creators out there. <laughs> it can lead to ruin. So that's the sort of story, the backstory there. Now, what do you think they're going to do with this? Because you've got various points you can join this story. You've got them setting up the kingdom. I think got, the kingdom's going to be set. You think I it's going to be I don't think they're going to be, we're going to be seeing the migration of the elves there. I think they're going to be set. They are going to have been working with the dwarves and the, with Mithril and doing their own artifacts. And then once it's set up, I personally think that this is, you know, because let's face it, he's lazy. Uh, evil, you know, evil wants to take advantage of something that's already been done. I think he's going to come in there as a seductive force. He's already, you know, messed around with everybody else all over the place. So now he's going to focus his attention on getting the elf elven artificers to create these rings so that he can solidify his power. Well, he's not going to be able to do that so much if they're in the, in the, in the throes of setting up their society. Yeah. So, so, that, that would make sense to me as well. And they've got the other problem of the um, timelines that you might get several generations of dwarves going through. <laughs> you haven't got time to establish a sort of nexus of relationships yeah. if you don't just come in at the point where the crisis is about to happen. I think he's going to mention it. I think, I, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure these showrunners are going to mention it because they want to talk about all of these, some of the some of the things that they've been saying is that the this the show is going to reunite all um, all the stories of the Second Age surrounding the Rings of Power. So I would imagine setting up the kingdoms is just secondary to establishing the Rings of Power and distributing all nineteen. You know, they've got nineteen rings to distribute. Yeah, I mean, the equivalent is is saying to someone, "Go tell the." Go tell the story of the 19th century. Exactly. How are you going to do that? So you choose, oh, okay, I'm going to do it through the Industrial Revolution. I mean, that's what they're doing, isn't it? It's got that. I think so. Scope. I think so. I mean, it, it just, just as a matter of logistics as a writer, you, you just, I, it would boggle the mind. I mean, Tolkien did it in his appendices. He wrote them down as his backstory. Yeah, but he doesn't he doesn't flesh out the whole backstory because he it's his story. He's more interested in creating the, the the third age that he's doing, and he needs the second age to be there to be able to draw on. Well, so these guys are going to have to sort of fill in the blanks, but you can't fill in the blanks over thousands of years. So you're going to have to pick and choose where they're going to have the stories. I mean, they've already said they're going to be doing the second. They've already established there will be a second season. Okay, so we don't know where the end point's going to be, but there's one aspect which we haven't mentioned um, when we've been talking about that is which you get from the Unfinished Tales in particular, which is the possibility of a, a, a secret society at the middle of this. So Keller Brimbor has a secret society of the Mirdan who are dedicated to creating things. And it's this is a kind of 
like a Freemasonry or something within Elvendom. <laughs> that's quite different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it'd be, and, and that's where the the infiltration happens within that rather than the traditional power structures within uh, the elven kingdoms. So I'm, I'm, in, I'm going to enjoy seeing how they establish this and, and what they decide, because there's not many much details about what the secret society does or anything other than makes things. So that would be a great thing to elaborate. I think that's a great idea. I hope they really do. It. Well, I really I'm hope they sure, do that. Probably they're reading this stuff in, the, I'm, I'm reading it. They must've thought, Oh Yeah. Uh, hopefully they'll have gone back and found the, these things to put because we, we've got a series of like pegs dates and other things and that isn't a story that's just a set of yeah. dates so they've got to find the narrative arc so a, a couple of you know we've got it intersects with the different peoples through the rings so you've got the three elven rings and the story there is about hiding them exactly got the seven dwarf ones where i think there were contradictory said things said throughout the tolkien legendarium on that as to where they get them from but it does say in the appendices of um return of the king that during the third got his ring directly from the elven smiths so that there's a sort of direct rather than from sauron because you know, sauron was using them as a kind of bribe you know handing them out um, so it's possible there's a kind of division within the dwarves. I don't know if we'll see all seven dwarf lords, but you know you can imagine they're going to elaborate the dwarf um, com community and their relationship with the, the rings. What always struck me about the dwarves is even though that they the rings were controlled by the one by Sauron, he didn't have that much control over them. Yeah, he so, really didn't. I mean, it. it, it the dwarves went on their way. I mean, yeah, the rings created greed. The rings created, you know, the strife that went on between the families and, and all of that, you know, that shows up in The Hobbit and other things. But essentially, he didn't really control them. No, they don't end up as the equivalent of dwarven ring wraiths, do they? Mm -mm, no. Um, so, which may be something to do with the fact that they were created differently and their stony, stubborn nature. But that that would be an interesting theme. And then, of course, there's the nine which are given to mortal men, of whom only a few we actually are actually traced to particular leaders. But those stories may be a bit tangential to the events of the war of the. This but you're going to need them somewhere. Yeah, they're it's going to be have to show up. Um, I mean, obviously they're uh, uh, wandering around the third age, so they're there in the second. And I would imagine in the last alliance, because I'm assuming we're going to be building up to that. Yeah, okay. So let's before we let's say what the last alliance yeah, yeah. is. This this you'll be pleased to hear, um, Lord of the Rings films fans, as you've already seen. Because it comes right at the beginning of Fellowship of the Ring. The last alliance of elves and men is when Gil Gallard, another new name to many people, uh, joins up with um Elendil and Isildur, who are Aragorn's forebears and they stand against Sauron and the ring is cut from his hand that isn't a plot spoiler because of course it's where the films start everybody knows it so the that's, entire third, yeah. so that, that certainly won't be a first series thing I mean if they're going to do like five series you might reach at the end of fifth series but there's so much material to cover just a little sidebar then on Gil Gallad um, you do hear about him in the Lord of the Rings in a song, which Sam actually sings um, uh, just before the attack on Weathertop. And you learn from there that he's an elven king. Um, uh, but you can read much more about him in the other sort of Tolkien writings. So he's a very high lord. He's one of the sort of top-notch elves uh, who come over and set up a kingdom, which if you imagine the map of... Uh, Middle Earth, it's kind of above the Shire, a big area north of the Shire, and that kingdom lasts for a very long time. And he is the high king of all the elves in Middle Earth at that time. So another main character. And Elrond's boss. Yeah, Elrond's boss, that's right. <laughs> uh, and if Galadriel is in some ways the senior elf by the time you get to the third age he was the senior elf in the second age 
So that 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 all kind of maps fairly fairly well. Okay, so one question for you, Paula: How does this connect? We were talking in our live stream about the Numenor story because that really is the major event for humans in this how does it how would you connect the making of the rings and the rings of power to the Numenor story bearing well, in mind men live like mayflies compared to the elves who are involved in the making of the rings well the common denominator is Sauron yeah and Sauron he not only is sitting around trying to seduce the the elves and getting his way with them and creating the rings of power. He's also creating a base for himself in Numenor, which is the equivalent of Atlantis. I would, I would imagine in, in, in many ways in, in that it's a group of, of, of humans who live between Arda and middle earth in this um, Island kingdom where Men live for many, even even short-lived men live for many, many, many years, for nearly a thousand years, for very long periods of time, and they rule, and they're they're considered, um, you know, almost demigods. Yeah, they they're in, given in their um, way. they're given Numenor as a reward for their event, their actions in the end of the first age. Exactly, and they're, they're given a sort of special. I suppose we'd call it a special blessing of longer life. And it's Elrond's brother, Elros, who's chosen the mortal life, who goes and sets up the lineage there. Exactly. But the, we got, we've got to make the point that these are centuries and centuries and centuries. Um, there are many stories to tell in Numenor all on its own with no connection to um, the rings. But there is one point of connection which comes once things go horribly wrong uh, in Eregion and Sauron. Um, basically destroys Celebrimbor's kingdom. Um, things, are, things are looking very bad. So Elrond is sent by Gil-galad to kind of help, but he's kind of finds it overrun. So he retreats to somewhere that becomes Rivendell. That's the founding of Rivendell. And, and I think that's going to be. I think that's going to be important. I really think finding yeah, Rivendell yeah. and fa the founding of Rivendell and creating the Elrond character is going to be very important. Yeah, so there's that to look forward to. But also within that, um, Gil-galad, who he, he's not like a Superman, he's, he's struggling against to hold back the, uh, the armies of Sauron. And his kingdom is saved by the arrival of the Numenorean fleet under the king Tar Minastir, yes. who comes along. Um, Numenor has flourished as a shipping power and naval nation, and they turn the tide of the battle. You see a sort of echo of this in the Battle of the Pelennor when Aragorn arrives on the ships. It's a kind of smaller scale version of this, but it has the same effect. It turns the battle. And then what happens is that um, the battle in some ways becomes between Sauron and the Numenorians, and they take the very bad decision to take Sauron back to Numenor yep. as a captive and lo and behold, he goes up to his set of tricks there and he manages to seduce the king there by the lure of power. And, and that power is with the Valar. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of rivaling. It's the Tower of Babel um, trying to rival the godlike powers. And that that come, brings about their downfall and the tidal wave that sweeps them away. And a remnant escapes of people who have kept true to the faith. And these are Aragorn's ancestors, Elendil, Isildur, and co. So, but that is thousands of years. I, I don't know, maybe a thousand. It's, it's a long time time later. And so you don't get connecting characters between the stories of the Numenorians and the events of the making of the rings and this this is this for me is the biggest problem as how are we going to connect them hey, yeah I, i've been trying to figure out how, how that connection is going to exist i'm going to imagine and this is only because this is just how i imagine things i imagine that as we're telling the story of the rise of the elven kingdoms and the the rings and and all of these other aspects of what's going on i i would imagine that you're going to have some 
sidebar episodes where you're going to have interactions with the Numenorians so that you at least know that this exists, that this, that there's this special area of middle or of, of the world between Arda and middle earth that you have these humans. And, and from what I could understand and from what I was looking at the cast list, they may have a couple hobbits. Yeah. The uh, they said the Harfoots are going to be in there. Okay. That's well, all I've got from that. That's so. definitely coloring outside the lines of. I Very mean, much outside you know, the line, but there's fine. going to be a <laughs> hobbit somewhere. And I thought that was. I, but I would welcome it. that because oh, I would too. Because you don't have where does the where does the human touch come? And and for human, I mean, really, Hobbit. Um, it'd be great, wouldn't it? Be great if some of these hobbits were actually women. Oh, that why not nice. have a bunch of really go get them hobbit women? That'd be fantastic because one of the problems, um, well, problems of yeah, its time is that Lord of the Rings, you can you can actually. Sp- quite easily name all the female characters on by counting off the fingers of one hand um and it definitely needs serious diversification just to be of our if you're making something new of our time that's what you would do so i if, if they're listening i'd, I'd really yeah, love to see listening. yeah i really just <laughs> well, they I want to see more elven women <laughs> i mean you can you know yeah. I mean, dwarven even, women, dwarven women. There, there is obviously uh, there is some, um, isn't it? You know, dis is bent. Well, that's way back. That's way in the third age. But we know there are strong dwarven couple. women too. So, um, anyway, that's that's what we hope. I hope so, they do more with women. I truly do. Although it looks like it, just when you look at, if you go online and look at the cast list, yeah. it doesn't give all of the names of everyone, but there are women there. <laughs> Yeah, it's a good yeah. sign. Yeah, and and a sort of um, colorblind casting as well would be good, which I think they're going for. Yes, they are definitely. They are. Um, That's what we've I've moved on. That. The world has moved on. So, a couple of just to sort of to round up this discussion, I think that um, it's interesting what they're going to do with Galadriel and Celeborn because when you look at the materials, Tolkien, I don't think ever totally settled on a story as to where they were during the second age. Now, one version of it is that they're spending some of their time in Eregion. And when it's overrun, they end up on um, uh, the Bay of Dol Amroth down there, and which is down where Prince Imrahil, one of the captains of Gondor, comes from. Uh, and then another story is uh, that a bit later, they go across the Misty Mountains um, and take over... Lorien when the leader of Lorien, Amroth, is killed. So I don't know if they have to stick to a certain version of the story. Um, there are various, not entirely, the story is told several times slightly differently. And Tolkien had great fun with this when he changed his mind. He always said, oh, yes, the records are not clear on this subject. He allows himself <laughs> to do that pretense that, you know, there's conflicting historical things. So they could actually have... Um, Galadriel and Celeborn actually present in Eregion with Celebrimbor. Um, and and there, is, there is a version of this where that's possible. And partially also the, there's a, a one, I read it in one of the Unfinished Tales that Celebrimbor was very fond of Galadriel, which is one of the reasons she got one of the three. Yes. Yeah. No, that, that there was, it, um, So there could be a whole triangle going with <laughs> Being Hollywoodish, they might oh, do no, that. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, because yeah, he, I mean, he did give her one. He did give her, I think, uh, Vilia, and um, why not? He had the reason, I and mean, he had to figure out why he gave the rings to whomever he gave the rings to. So, you know, well, could it not be just that she was the? Let's not. It doesn't have to be because she's in love with her. It could be just that um, she's the wisest. So he gives. Um, doesn't he give them to Gilgalad? So Gilgalad has he's he and Gilgalad gives one to Kirdan the shipwright, and Kirdan the shipwright, you following, gives yeah, I know <laughs> ring, I'm talking to everyone else, gives his ring to Gandalf. Gandalf. So there's this um little connection here that does the circle. Uh, Elrond has his because um 
he's a good dude and he's clearly worthy of having the ring. So when Gilgalad goes for the final alliance, Elrond has it. So, yes. Um, but, but I mean, the, the thing is with Galadriel, again, you'll notice everybody else was a male who got the rings. Yeah, well, at least she got there. and So she got a ring, and yeah, maybe because Cal- Cal- Calabrimbor saw something in her. I, I will I, I will agree with you on that. I'm trying I'm reluctant to have a love triangle because I, I, I am too, it. but I'm just saying that was one of the things that was mentioned along the line. And they would grab onto. I would just imagine they would grab onto that almost immediately. <laughs> oh well, that would be never mind. I yes. hope they didn't do that. But anyway. And and I think there is one thing we should mention. There's going to be a um a challenge on tone because you alluded to it Keller Brimble comes to an extremely grisly end yes. um his body is basically put on a pole and paraded yes. in front of the armies of Sauron so it's definitely a level of violence which is a step up from in the films of Lord of the Rings they managed to have an element of cartoonish violence whenever they did any close quarter stuff there was a often a, some joke, almost a sort of joke aspect. Um, yeah, the whole Legolas Gimli, yeah, 12, fourteen. Oh, I'll go over yeah, that. and we didn't yes. really feel a particular. Yeah. It wasn't grisly in the same way, yes. Because um, the most sort of one of the most grisly deaths, I suppose, is Boromir with lots of arrows in him, but it's still quite respectful. Uh, it's not the sort of torture aspect which you get potentially here so there's going to be a challenge there um and how to cover that without making it too unfriendly it, for family watchers it's i'm not sure how friendly the family friendly this is going to be having seen some of the other things that show up on prime um well we'll see i mean i hope so yeah. i just because it is one of the grimmest things you can just imagine it it's yeah. just awful but um Mind you, having said that, I suppose the the Rohan people did put someone's head on a pike. Um, yeah, you know, did. but I suppose because it's a uh, Urukai, it, it, it's the funny. We don't care. Bandage, you know, <laughs> we don't <laughs> care. It's an and all their blood is blue, just so you know, it's that kind of thing um, to make it so it could get the right certificate in the cinemas. Anyway, so a little bit more knowledge has leaked out. So just to hit the headlines again um paula you were saying that the date is the 2nd of september 2nd of september it's being released weekly as opposed to all dumped out in one go personally exactly. i like that because it means i savor it it's like having a box of chocolates where you only eat one at a time rather than scoff the whole lot so, so you the know i, I like it doesn't work <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, oh, one other thing. Um, for the second season, they're moving out of New Zealand and they're going to England. Yeah, we'll see if that actually happens. They sometimes say they're going to do that. So that's all. And then they negotiate a whole announced. new load of tax breaks. We'll see. That'll do and it. <laughs> there's also the aspect of, um, due to the pandemic, that it's much harder to get in and out of New Zealand at the moment because of the policies of keeping COVID out rather than living with it. So that might well actually happen, yeah. So, yeah. Well, that's, I think that's, um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I heard or read. No, I think that's, we've recovered the basis on- Pretty much all of it. Yeah. yeah, well, thanks very much, Paula. And thanks for coming in at short notice just to talk about this. My pleasure. And, yeah, and uh, thank you everyone for listening. Thanks, Julia, take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to MythMakers Podcast, brought to you by the Oxford Centre for Fantasy. Visit OxfordCentreForFantasy.org to join in the fun. Find out about our online courses, in-person stays in Oxford, plus visit our shop for great gifts. Tell a friend and subscribe wherever you find your favourite podcasts worldwide.